So we've been talking about the time famine that we're all experiencing and what we can do to fix it. And I think this is a spot where our, our little cognitive triad framework is going to be especially important. Starting first with the idea that we think we need to all think differently when it comes to time management. In particular, we need to recognize the value of time affluence, both for ourselves and for our kids. What is time affluence? We all probably know what affluence is, right? If you Google the word affluence, you get images like this of like gold and big piles of money and stuff like that. When we think of wealth, we tend to think of monetary wealth. But researchers have been pointing to the importance of time wealth or time affluence, which is just the subjective sense that you have sufficient time for whatever you want to do, whether that's social stuff, leisure stuff, other activities that you find meaningful. It's sort of the opposite of time famine. You just feel like you're wealthy in terms of time. It's a feeling that so many of us don't have right now. But the research shows that it's really incredibly important. First, there's tons of studies showing that time affluence makes us happier. This is work that comes from the Harvard Business School professor, Ashley Willens, where she surveys people and says, do you prioritize your time? Are you, are you the type of person that would give up money to get back time? Or are you the type of person that would like give up time to kind of get more money? Maybe you don't take your vacations, you take more hours at work. And so people self-report. And she finds that the people who self-report giving up time to get more money wind up being significantly more unhappy than people who are kind of willing to kind of give up a little money or take extra, take less hours at work or so on to kind of get back more time, right? Just focusing on prioritizing your time affluence makes you happier. But there's also lots of studies showing that just that feeling of being more time affluent makes us better people. Lots of studies show that people who are more time affluent want to prioritize their social connections. And you sort of get that. You maybe didn't need the research to tell you that. When you're feeling a little bit more free with time, that's when you call your friends or make plans and so on. Research by Ashley's lab shows that even just sort of priming people with the idea of busyness makes them less social. You do this study where you just kind of word scramble words that are about being busy when you're in a coffee shop and you talk less to the people around you just because I've kind of primed in your mind this idea of being busy. And so much research suggests that our social connection matters for our happiness. When we're busy, we just don't do that. Whether that's with our friends and family members, but also with our family, when we're kind of feeling a little bit overwhelmed and burned out, we're not finding those sort of moments of joy or fun. Like we're often just kind of feeling really spent and burned out. So feeling time famished, feeling less time affluent, we wind up being less social. But we also kind of become like not so great people when we're feeling really overwhelmed. There's lots of studies showing the kind of kindness consequences of feeling busy. One of my favorite studies was from back in the 1970s, which asked the question, are people as nice to others when they are in a rush? And I love this study because they did this not with kind of lay people or like parents on the street. They did this with a group of subjects that really should be kind of nice. They did this with the folks who are studying at the Princeton Theological Seminary. Like these are folks who are studying to be priests. And so here's how the experiment worked. The, the kind of to be kind of would be priests were told, um, you have to go to a different room and give a seminar about the story of the Good Samaritan. You have to do this presentation. Now bracketed, you all know what the story of the Good Samaritan is, I'm guessing, like you kind of help people who are in need. So like you gotta go do this like high profile kind of speech, um, but you have to walk across campus to do it. And the key was that these seminary participants were told that they had to get there by a certain time. Some were like, oh, you're kind of in a really low rush. You've got lots of time to get there. Some were told, you got to get there pretty expeditiously, medium. And some were like, it's happening really soon. You got to get over there right away. The seminary participants run over. But since this is the 1970s and we had like different ethics rules of experiments back in the day, this experiment was able to set up that as these would-be priests are running over to do this seminar presentation, there's a staged person who's lying on the street looking in extreme distress, who looks like an unhoused individual who's kind of like stuck there, seemingly in need of attention. Bracketed, literally the Good Samaritan <laughs> story. And the question was, do the priests stop to help or do they rush and just go to this thing they need to do? And I love this study, so I'm gonna nerd out and show you the graph. Here's the percentage of priests that actually help, so bigger bars is more helping. Here's what happens when the priests are in the low rush, already kind of bad, like only less than two thirds of priests are actually helping. But I'm showing you the graph, of course, because it gets worse when the priests are in a medium rush or in the high rush where 90% of priests don't help when they're walking over to give a story about the importance of being a good Samaritan. And so if this is priests, you know, <laughs> imagine the rest of us when we're in a rush, right? And again, I don't know if we need this study. You know what's happening when you're in the moment of triage, like 
your friend has a bad, you know, health diagnosis, you know, somebody needs, like, you're just like, can't even, right? Imagine how much nicer the world would be if we were all feeling a little bit more time affluent. And so that's suggesting that maybe we need to think differently about time affluence. Maybe we need to prioritize it for ourselves, but also our kids who we want to be good social people. But when I talk about this, sometimes parents will push back and say, yeah, we get the importance of time affluence, but especially for our kids, you know, the stuff they're busy with is good, right? The stuff they're busy with isn't just kind of random stuff. It's like the enrichment we want them to get to become you know, academically stronger and maybe better candidates for college, right? We can't scale back on that, right? We can't think that time famine is too bad because we need to sort of prioritize all this enrichment and stuff. But is that really the case, right? There is, is it really the case that our kids' learning and, and achievement requires them to be so busy? Um, this is a spot where I think it's really important to check in because I think these days we assume that our kids' schedules have to be this busy, but it's worth remembering that this is like the first time in human history kids have been this scheduled. So already we're getting a sense that like it doesn't have to be this way. Um, but what about actual achievement culture? Well, recently there was a big study that sort of looked at this by Cadno and colleagues. They kind of asked the question, is more enrichment actually good for all the outcomes we want our kids to achieve? And so this is this group of economists. They kind of tested this in these really big, broad samples. And they found at first what you might have guessed, which is like the more enrichment activities kids have, kind of the better their test scores. But as these economists like did a deeper dive into the data, they realized that that correlation isn't even there because what the correlation is really about was what they would call a wealth effect. In other words, if you're a wealthy family and you have way more money, you tend to be the kind of people who put your kids in way more enrichment and your kids' test scores are higher. But if you factor out wealth, what happens is that effect completely goes away. Enrichment is not doing the work. It seems like if you just have a wealthy kid, they're more likely to have the stuff to get the good test scores, right? But what that means is that the enrichment is not helping. And so these researchers did a deeper dive onto how bad this is. And they find that, again, controlling for wealth, the last hour of homework and activities you have basically has no effect on your test scores, but it does have a very significant effect on your mental health. So they basically find like a little bit of enrichment is good, but it's got diminishing returns on test scores, but they find the opposite pattern on well-being. So the more time you're spending, especially like that last very busy hour, is actually hurting kids. And so the main result of their paper and the kind of big blow quote in the paper is, there is a big psychological downside to overscheduling our kids, and it is not having the academic healthy effect that we expect. And so I think even if we just were thinking about prioritizing time affluence, these kinds of data should give us pause. We're actually doing our kids a disservice by keeping them this busy. It's not to say they should have no kind of enrichment stuff. It's just like the level that we put them at probably isn't doing the work we think. And so I think we need to think differently. I think we need to recognize the value that time affluence is playing for us, both in terms of our happiness and being the kind of people we wanna be. And I think we need to recognize that that same value is going to exist for our kids too.